This is the captain of the Enterprise. Ship ship. Podcasting. The final frontier. These are the ridiculous introductions I am forced to read at gunpoint. Or should I say, phaser point. Welcome to Ship to Ship, yet another in the long line of tedious Star Trek podcasts. The show is hosted by David Lawler and David B. Anderson. The two Davids will take you on a journey through time and space every three or four weeks, boldly podcasting where no podcast has gone before. Seriously? This is what you're making me read? Take it away, boys. This is episode two of Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast with your host. I'm David Lawler, and I'm speaking with David Anderson. How are you, David? I am well. Fascinating. You are well. You always say that. Yeah, I think you said that before. I am. I'm always well. I'm usually okay. <laughs> You're always like, I am well. I am I'm, well. I'm ready to do that. I'm actually kind of waving at the <laughs> waving at the webcam I'm going through. And, uh, <laughs> yes, you actually like, are. Hello. That's a drink, Jim. Hello. Uh, well, this episode is going to be about uh, Romulans. Uh, yes. The title of the episode is Beware Romulans Bearing Gifts, which is a line from Star Trek II. Uh, and t- today we'll be discussing the episode's Balance of Terror and the Enterprise incident. Um, Number one on our list of things to do. So uh, it, this is perhaps an indication of what is known as the Mandela Effect. That is a collective mis- misremembering of a fact or event. The Romulans, uh, genetically distant, not to mention emotional relatives of Mr. Spock's Vulcan race, complete with yeah. pointed ears, were introduced before the more popular enemies of the Federation, the Klingons. Uh, Balance of Terror was the seventh episode produced, uh, aired in December of 1966. The 14th episode aired because of the visual effects, uh, the model of the Romulan Bird of Prey warship designed by Wa Chung, uh, and the complex for the time animated effects that they had. Yeah, which, by the way, the version I watched was an already kind of re-digital, cleaned-up version of that. So. You watched you watched the, the I, remastered I, version? Yeah, I watched it on Netflix, yeah. And I had a question about that. You, you think it's possible that the the old original uh, broadcast episodes are no longer in circulation? You think they were taken out? You know, I, I haven't gone to the trouble to actually try to find out if if you can get the original versions. I would think that you could. Uh, well, they I, they are available in the Blu-ray set if you get because I have I have the Blu-ray box sets of uh, of season three anyway, um, and. The original episode is available, and so is the remastered version. Yeah, I'm so. I'm for me though. I've kind of gotten used to the new remastered versions because I I really do like those cleaned up effects. But I I understand your point from last time when when we discussed it that they look too good, that the effects look too. Yeah, they do. And it's like it seems like they kind of degrade them a little bit to try to make them fit in, but they still don't fit in. Especially because I mean I remember what the effects looked like. They were very kind of cheesy effects. They were and, they were cheesy, but I, I mean guess they were good the for the time. They were they were for revolutionary. The time they were okay. I mean they kind of it was weird. It's weird how like the effects kind of fit in with the the somewhat limited budget look of the show. Like the kind, yeah, the kind of limited. Yeah, it, it is. This was but uh, this was when the show first started. NBC gave them a very big budget, but then they cut it halfway through the season. I think they uh, cut the budget down by. I think they. Like I, I think the the budget might have been two hundred thousand dollars per episode. That's a lot of money for the time. But then after uh, the Menagerie episodes, uh, they cut the budget down to one hundred and seventy five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So this was this was Star Trek when they had the money. Even yeah. though they, they always complained they need more needed more money, but this was the most money they they were given to spend at this. Well, time. I mean, there are parts when and we'll get to like stuff when stuff explodes and and parts of ships fall and they have to move pieces and it's like mm-hmm. obviously styrofoam and they're trying to sort of go. <laughs> and it's like obviously it's just a piece of styrofoam. You don't have to. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, now I have the press release for you if you want to read it. The USS Enterprise embarks on a fateful seek and destroy mission following a series of unprovoked attacks by the marauding flot- flagship of enemy power in Balance of Terror. Oh. On NBC Television Network's color cast of Star Trek, William Shatner, douche, and Leonard Nimoy, nice guy, co star, co star, Captain Kirk Shatner engages in a hostile. Spacecraft in a furious mid-space battle 
but is forced to take quarter when the equally powerful enemy, although suffering serious losses itself, inflicts heavy damage and injuries on the Enterprise. With most of their power and weaponry gone, Kirk and his wily adversary become locked in a suspenseful battle of wits as they maneuver for advantage. Mark Leonard portrays the commander of the enemy craft. That's very good, and you made it sound really dirty. Well, well, I mean, come on. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hello. Oh. <laughs> uh, Mark Leonard, yes. Mark Leonard uh, plays a Romulan in this, and then, uh, of course, he, he winds up becoming Spock's dad later on. Yeah. And and I, I, I do wonder, like, how much older was he than Leonard Nimoy? Was he maybe even younger? Or they around the same age? They seem around the same age. Like, he's probably, what, his late 30s in this? Well, let me uh, let me take a quick peek in, on the Googles, and we'll find out. Um, I've always wanted to know that myself. I'll try Mark Renard. He's no longer with us, is he? No, no. Yeah, okay. He was born in 1924, October 15th. He's a Libra. How about that? Uh, 1924. Um, so he would have been older then, I think. Well, let's see. Let's check Lenny Nimoy. I think he was like 31. Nimoy. I think he, he, I think Nimoy is actually like just a yeah, little Yeah, 31. Old, 31. He, yeah. he was like just a little older than Shatner. They were like around the same age. That's right. Actually, yesterday was yeah. Nimoy's birthday. Um, there you go. And yes, so that would, make, that would make Nimoy how many? 24. Jeez, I'm really bad at math. Seven years? Seven, seven years. So it's, it's, it's fudgeable. It's it's acceptable you know well it's acceptable they get i don't know Len, mark leonard has a uh i don't know more mature look than Nimoy. he has the gray yeah which uh, distinguishes him he kind of looks older yeah and it, it's and, enough it, it's close enough it's sort of like do you remember the movie the manchurian candidate the original yeah uh, with, uh, lawrence uh, harvey uh, is the son of Angela Lansbury, and she isn't even. I think I'm not she's even like sure. younger. I think she's like a year younger than him. She just something. she just has one of these faces that looks she like she just had that face. Yeah, she just and she, it was like a face and an attitude. She's and, matronly. Yeah, <laughs> and she's and, evil uh, too. She's a wicked, horrible bitch in that movie. <laughs> great movie, by the way. If anybody... Great movie. One of my favorites. Have it on laserdisc actually, mm -hmm. and starring the very beautiful Leslie Parrish, who was in an episode of Star Trek later on. Oh. Uh, and uh, also, actually, there's a whole bunch of people in this movie that were uh, that were in Star Trek episodes, like James Gregory and uh, Jay. I want to say Jay Anderson, people like that. Um, so we have a five star episode of the original yeah, Star Trek. Series. I would agree. In fact, the the thing that reminded me I, this reminded me of Wrath of Khan. <laughs> yeah, in a way, because it don't... was he was Battle of Wits. They're 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 viewing each other on the screen. Neither one will give up. They're each trying to sort of outthink each other, and then weird stuff happens. And yeah, yeah, it, it's it's similar to Star Trek Two because we have a situation where both captains of their vessels are flying blind, and they really don't know where each other. Do is. they really explain why, as the Romulans? Because they basically explain that the Romulans, because they kind of introduce the Romulans as a concept. They say. There was a war a hundred years ago. Um, yeah, or, yeah, fifty, maybe a hundred. I would say probably. They said a hundred. They said a hundred years ago. Did I they say because the, the Paul Comey, who plays St Styles, yeah, he's like angry and racist with regard to like Romulans, and several members of his family died during the war. Yeah, but I know, I know. It's, it seems weird, but I swear. It I mean, that's like being mad at you know my a lot of my family, maybe some of yours as well, served in World War Two, and they were fighting Nazis, right? Uh, wouldn't that be like being mad at all Germans right now? Oh, there's still a lot more? of people like that. <laughs> well, there are, but the you know, I mean, like he's young. He's not like he, if this was a long ago war, he wouldn't be. Would he really harbor that kind of hostility Maybe. even uh, now? You know, the South. I mean, we have the South, and they still pissed off that they lost. It. <laughs> so. I well, okay, uh, um, but um, but I'm like, you know. Well, I said here in my notes that maybe the feelings can be compared to those of the older generation that's still alive who served in World War II. Yeah. But again, Comey's character. You don't have to be angry about because we're a bunch of whiny people. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're I, living I, in an age of philosophy. That's what they, they said that there was like they showed they basically showed like they showed the the space age like view screen of like a drawing <laughs> of yeah. the neutral zone, and. Uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah, it looked like it looked like my daughter. Cool. It looked like my daughter made that thing. <laughs> kind of reminded me of that thing they did in Star Trek uh, Six when they like computer enhancement. And it's like a drawing. 
but so they show what the neutral zone is. They explain what it is. And that actually, yeah, yeah. because I never really knew exactly what the neutral zone was. I knew it was like something you couldn't, but the, this helped me understand the neutral zone is a thing. It's, it's yeah, but isn't the, there a neutral zone with regard to the Klingons too? I thought that too. So I was a little confused about Remember that. Remember the whole Kobayashi Maru test that yeah. Kirstie Alley takes at the beginning of Star Trek too? Perhaps, perhaps the neutral zone, maybe there's some sort of like Star Trek super nerdy map that shows the neutral zone and how it kind of goes around and goes through like it goes. Yeah, that's another thing. How do you, goes how do you map uh, space in a three dimensional way when the map is kind of one dimensional? Can you go around or below or above the neutral zone? Uh -huh. <laughs> but they explain that like this captain, the Romulan captain, is intentionally going on the Earth side of the, the neutral zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're yeah, it, I but think, he's not I under think... specific orders. He's like doing it on his own, isn't he? Um, no, no, he he is following orders because of this new cloaking device that they have, and yeah, they want to like, test it, right? They want to test, test it, it, and they're attacking all the the little like things on asteroids that they've set up around the neutral zone, the Earth, the yeah, Federation, these outposts, these outposts, and they're slowly like attacking them, and then that's that's why they shut now. Does remember does that? The I mean, that horrible uh, bit where Kirk is uh, trying to talk to the commander. To the guy, and like, there's like, a fire and an explosion. He's like, "This is Commander Hanson. Do you read me, Enterprise? Do you yeah. read me? They're firing something!" Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and they show they show this whole. Can, he says, "Can we see? Can we see?" And they put on the visual, and this guy's like in a room full of fire. Yeah. <laughs> He's all messed up and dying. Yeah, and they do, and, and and then they, and then then that blows up, and then. Now they're they are there just surveying, right? Like, are are they there to investigate why they aren't getting communications or something like that? Did they explain that? I maybe I forgot. Like, uh, well, they're patrolling along the edge of the neutral zone patrolling. because they're not, they yeah, just because of to these be there attacks. When it's happening, they're not. Which there is on. not a good time to do it, considering that we like begin the episode with a wedding. This this. Oh uh, 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 yeah, I knew something bad was going. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, something something bad's going to happen. That's not. Yeah, one of them is going to die. It's not going to be the woman. I thought though. it was I both. That. I thought it was going to be both at least. <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome if they had like somehow help. We're holding hands in a fiery room and they're dying or something like that. But <laughs> mm. so. Everybody um, is on edge. They're all tense. Spock fills us in on the story of the Romulans. And then the rest, you know, Styles and the rest of the bridge crew get to see a Romulan for the first time ever, thanks to Spock. And then everybody starts looking at Spock. Like yeah, they're looking Romulan. like him. Like, yeah. And I don't think Spock, I mean, Spock kind of explains it like he he didn't know. He, yeah, he, 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 he didn't know, but I think he suspected, yeah. which is funny. I mean, like, they all look at him. And it's like the mentality of prejudice or whatever. But Nimoy I mean, has a very good look on his face. He's like, yeah, yeah, I guess he looks like me. Well, I mean, but <laughs> I was thinking, like, how could there have been an Earth-Romulan conflict that would seem to have been settled through sort of uh, passive-aggressive tweets back and forth yeah. so, that they, <laughs> so that they set it up? Like, okay, but I'm like, how could they have dealt whatever with Whatever happened, the Romulans probably started that. Yeah, the Vulcans, exactly. Vulcans don't answer. You know, they only yeah. answer if they're provoked. Yeah, but... How could there have been a conflict between them and Earth, but not them and 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 the Vulcans? Because if they're kind of related to them, I would think that they would have been closer in space. What I think happened, I mean, they had, like, there was an episode of Next Generation, right? Uh, some Involving Spock's character, which was kind of like a plug for Star Trek VI. And I think what happened was you had, like, the Vulcans... Romulans were part of Vulcan or something, and I guess they didn't want to give up their emotions or anything like that. So they yeah, left. they're 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 almost like sort of Klingon Vulcans, you know? Yeah. They're like more passionate, violent, although yeah. probably not as violent as Klingons. But yeah, yeah. they're more. They're, although when I think of like a passionate Vulcan, I'm thinking like full on crazy. Like that's the reason that they embrace logic. Well, like Cybok or something. Yeah. So, well, what is Cybok? Does Cybok was, even, Cybok Cybok was like sense? a hippie. Cybok was a hippie. He wasn't like. He wasn't fully embraced. He didn't see when I imagine like a passionate, like the reason that they did they embraced the logic was because they were just these crazy bipolar, crazy people, and that's maybe, why maybe. they did that. Whereas I, I, I kind of view them just as like Vulcans that behave like us. That's how, sort of how I saw it. Well, we so, agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> okay, but Styles, uh, he he gets angrier, and he's a very interesting character, Kirk. Kirk tries to put his like anger into perspective by like first he ignores him and then yeah. he tells him to ignore his feelings. So Kirk actually gets angry at Styles' anger 
which is interesting. <laughs> he gets pissed off at him for getting pissed off. Well, I, I gotta say, I kind of got pissed off at Chandler's hair in this. I mean, this might be a Chandler's hair. <laughs> just this might be a recurring theme of me complaining about his hair. Okay. Because, like, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's lit weird and sometimes it's not. And this one, like, there are parts of it where it seems like it's still kind of his hair a little bit with a with a fill in piece. And then there are other times when the piece kind of like shifts forward, and then and then we'll get in, in another episode. We'll get to like how I think like his hair is. They they just kind of gave up on his hair. <laughs> like by the third season, it seemed like they kind of gave up on his hair a little bit. I thought. Well, yeah, they that I uh, what you remember we were talking uh, about Daniel Craig and Sean Connery before. Yeah. And they put there's like this widow's peak. There's very small little widow's peak that's on yeah. there. That, that I think is part of the piece I guess that Shatner had because um, I don't think he actually has that I don't think that's his natural part no in fact his hair has gotten I would say the last 20 years his hair has been great <laughs> it's round I mean it's I think it's what it's what it's naturally supposed to look like is round but who knows what it originally looked like he probably started losing his hair in his 20s and you know maybe, maybe yeah. um, so we uh, we go back and forth and we it, it, I, I think what really works about this episode, it's it's unfortunate too because there was some really good writing early on on the show, where I felt the emphasis was was on the burden of Captain Kirk, and then you kind of see we go to this Romulan commander, played by Mark Lennard, uh -huh. and he is a he is a, a like a mirror image of Captain Kirk. Yeah, I I feel like he was doing it because he was he was following orders. But he didn't seem conflicted about those orders either. Like he wasn't like we're doing this even though we know it's wrong because they didn't think it was wrong. I don't because... know. He seemed he seemed really. Uh... Well, it was like he 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 gained. He seemed really disillusioned by war, and he didn't. Well, like it was the more like these... he got that he 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 had respect for whatever the whoever the commander was because he didn't really communicate with him or know he was named Kirk. But he is like, you know, he will do this. He's doing this. You know, yeah, I, they're, they're, I they both play him. this. They both play this game, where they're like, "What is he going to do next? What's his next move?" Well, I, this is what he, I would do if I were him. And and then you have the last bit where he, like, Spock actually makes a mistake. <laughs> like he's yeah. he's fiddling around on the thing trying to fix something, and then he puts his hand up and he pushes a button, and then that alerts them That's to right, yeah. where he is. And then first Kirk is like, "Oh no!" And then he's like, "Wait a minute." <laughs> I can do, I can use this, and then they did. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, now I wanted to get into some of my observations about this about the episode. Yeah. Now it's it's for me it's hard to hate Paul Comey's character, even though he's like telegraphed. He's obviously telegraphed to be the real bad guy, not the Romulan commander. The bad guy of the piece is racism. The message is clear. It's persecution, and and prejudice are the real enemies. Not ideological Our differences rec recurring themes up until you know star trek sex you know let them die yeah you know, let, them, kind of, let them die let or them planetary die. boundary it's a great message but it doesn't erase styles feelings he he has i mean the thing about racism and all that you have every right to feel the way you feel that and you can't you can't erase someone's heart you can't erase their their conscience you can't erase how they feel so they're always going to feel that way until the day they decide to stop feeling that way yeah and 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 I, you know, politicians have long complained about that because it, we we've we've kind of gone into like a new age where we're policing each other, uh, and and now we have these these safe spaces and we have trigger warnings and things like that. Yeah. So people uh, people are policing each other and they're making... well, pe and people are policing themselves because they don't want any trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. One one bad Twitter announcement, and you could get fired from your job. And before you <laughs> before you know it, you've set up a neutral zone. You know, mind your own business, Mister Spock. I'm sick of your half breed interference. Do you hear? So we you, we both agree that because we started the episode with a wedding, we knew someone was going to die. Yes, and I we was were pretty both. sure it was going to be Tomlinson, the young man, right? I was I was just thinking they were both going to die, but I didn't know exactly. Because I'm like, first of all, when they when they bring a new actor in that I've never heard of or seen or mm -hmm. in anything, and this applies to pretty much any show, I'm like, somebody's getting, somebody's dying. Somebody. Well, I was I, thinking, was this I, was this the beginning of the red shirt is going to die? Because he did have a red shirt, didn't he? Not, no, 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 not famously the red shirt. The 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 I think the episodes where the red shirts, a lot of red shirts die, are like 
maybe in the sec- more, second maybe season. Maybe on a planet and things like that. There's an episode called The Apple from season two where, like, freaking five red shirts die. And they're spaced right. apart every five minutes. And then there's another one called Obsession, which I think we're going to talk about next time. I'm not sure. Uh, where a bunch of red shirts just die from this vampire blood-sucking cloud or something. <laughs> and yeah. it's like a personal thing for Kirk or something. But I was thinking, this is what I was thinking, uh, that the that Styles should have been the, the one who died. That way his death would have had more meaning. It would have carried more emotional weight. I would have... I would have had him rescuing Spock instead of Spock rescuing well, Styles. And then you could have cut that whole... We- if you're going to do that, you could have a little bit more with him, cut that whole wedding thing out, and then had a little bit more explosions in space. It and- could have, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that was the idea of, like, we need more story in here because if we have too much space and special effects, it's just going to cost us more money. <laughs> so it's like, let's put, let's put some weird drama in here. We can just stuff it full of extraneous things and, and we'll wrap it up somehow at the end. Yeah. And then that way I- we don't have to blow things up and it's cheaper. <laughs> Yeah, I guess unfortunately it's kind of like hindsight because I thought the strong, the strongest performance in the piece was Styles, the actor who plays him, Paul Comey. I thought he was, because he 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 really understands this, and that's that's a great thing about actors who get it, who understand. He's supposed to be angry, and he screams at Sulu. Actually, I, I think Sulu suggests that they should just get get the hell out of there and warn Starfleet and do all this, and he says, "You don't understand. These are Romulans. If you run away, you guarantee a war." You know, mm-hmm. and uh, Sulu was, of course, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, my. Obviously, their weaponry is superior to ours, and they have a practical invisibility screen. You're discussing tactics. Do you realize what this really comes down to? Millions and millions of lives hanging on what this vessel does next. Or on what this vessel fails to do, Doctor. Yes, well, gentlemen, the question still remains. Can we engage them with a reasonable possibility of victory? No question. Their power is simple impulse. Meaning we cannot run. To be used in chasing them or retreating. Sir. Go ahead, Mr. Stiles. I call this session for opinions. We have to attack immediately. Explain. They're still on our side of the neutral zone. There would be no doubt that they broke the treaty. Attack without a visible target. How do we aim our phasers? Aim with sensors. Not accurate, but if we blanket them, we can... I know it's for a lucky shot before they zero in on us. And if we don't, once back, they'll report that we saw their weapons and ran. And if they could report that they destroyed us. These are Romulans. You run away from them and you guarantee war. They'll be back, not just one ship, but with everything they've got. You know that, Mr. Science Officer. You're the expert in these people. But you've always left out that one point. Why? I'm very interested in why. So uh, what's interesting is uh, uh, McCoy is often the guy in the group to bust on Spock. And it's interesting to see him, you know, being not only the adult but he's like an elder statesman he's providing psychological guidance to kirk when he needs it and occasionally mccoy will be a sounding board for kirk and spock mccoy wants no war he doesn't want anyone to get hurt well yeah and also again these are all this is like this new threat that nobody even knew was there and it's frightening it's frightening (laughs) and then and they never knew their face and then it's this whole sort of weird conflict with with spock like somehow it's his like he should he should be responsible for these people that he doesn't really know anything about. I mean, yeah. even though we we know like uh, practically, he should not be responsible for that at all. No, luckily, I mean, like that's why it's such great about at least Kirk and McCoy will defend Spock, and everyone else will too, except yeah. for Styles. Styles is the only guy; he's the odd man out. He hates Spock until <laughs> Spock, of course, saves his life. Yeah, with this weird convenient gas leak thing, or. Was it a yeah, gas? I don't, I, I don't know what it was. It was phasers. They were in. They it was were. Like, it was like the chamber, and it flooded with some sort of gas and everything. And I'm like, well, the whole geez. thing has like a submarine vibe to it. I because... think they were talking about like radiation or something. I'm like, you know, when some sort of radioactive gas comes in, you breathe there's it out. Some, yeah, there's some kind of pretty bluish pink coolant fluid. Thinking. I don't think you come back from that. Although I could be wrong. I think they're like you can take pills because they did that in. Uh... Doesn't it seem wildly impractical though to have well, like. But... You're supposed to be firing phasers. You should fire phasers up where you are, not having a crew down there to do it for you. But they're trying to keep. They're trying to do this um, sea battle with submarines type thing because of the cloaking device. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. It's and, like and, submarines hiding under the surface. That, of the that water. was the thing I, I noticed. Of like, 
I didn't know that, like, the, 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 kind of you know, spoiler alert, but at the end, like, they actually used the cloaking device on the ship. Or am, oh, I, what? Thinking, am I thinking of another one? I'm thinking of you another one. think of the Enterprise incident? I'm thinking of the Enterprise incident. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I think they take it a little too far. The writer, Paul Schneider, is good, good script. But they take it a little too far when everyone's whispering so that the Romulans can't hear. As far as I know, you know, sound doesn't travel through the vacuum of space. No, that's true. But for dramatic effect... So, yeah, it's for dramatic effect. It's for suspense. So, you know, I mean, Star Trek was distinctive for science fiction and entertainment at the time because the production actually retained the services of technical advisors. They had people from Rand Corporation, uh, DeForest Research, and Jet Propulsion Laboratories. So they were all, uh, all the treatments and the outlines and the scripts were all heavily scrutinized before shooting. So I'm sure somebody said, hey, wait a minute, why are they whispering? This is kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't get it. It's a submarine. Get it? It's a submarine movie. Oh, all right. But I also I do also enjoy that we see the enemy, and we see that the enemy is very much like us. Captain. Standing by to beam your survivors aboard our ship. Prepare to abandon your vessel. No, it's not our way. I regret that we meet in this way. You and I are of a kind in a different reality. I could have called you friend. The yeah. uh, like the Romulan commander, Mark Lennard, has an old man that they call the the Centurion. And he's he's um, he's talking to him, and he's bouncing ideas off of him, and they confide in each other. The Centaurian gets crushed by <laughs> a piece of styrofoam. Shit. Yeah, it comes, and it, they all are like really struggling. I'm like, I can tell it's a piece of because I think when it falls, it kind of bounces a little, you know, <laughs> bang, and then they're like, probably. I mean, like you don't want to you, you don't want to drop a heavy piece of metal on an actor and possibly kill him. Ah, then you not... have to call his wife. Uh, sorry, your your husband died. Yeah. While we were shooting an episode of a television show, yeah. so uh, Tomlinson, the 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 young man who was going to get married, winds up being the one who dies. They, um, uh, in this cat and mouse game, Kirk is anticipated where he thinks the Romulans are going to show up, and he he kind of baits baits them a little bit by making it look like they're injured, and then the Romulan ship decloaks, and he and he goes and he says fire, 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 and no one's firing because there's a coolant leak. Spock goes in there. He rescues he, he rescues Styles, but he just leaves Tomlinson for dead, which is kind of messed up. And again, it kind of <laughs> goes back to Star Trek too a little bit because that's kind of it's at least half of what Spock did. You know, when he went into the radiation filled, maybe that was why he was able to because like he can take that was why he was able to do that in Star Trek two and just go in there and not die immediately was because he's his Vulcan anatomy and that allows him to like not die in a yeah. radioactive thing at least not yeah. immediately. I guess. Well, also, Spock does make some stupid decisions once in a while. On the TV show, in the movies and stuff like that, he'll he'll do some stupid things, and I think that's the human half coming out. It's the human half, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. like, Yeah, I, if he was full Vulcan, he probably wouldn't have been pushed like that, that Apple button. episode, the Apple episode I mentioned to you about the red shirts, there's yeah. a scene where he actually pushes Kirk out of the way and takes a bunch of horrible poisonous thorns himself. And oh. Kirk is even like, you know... Next time, just tell me to move. I can step out of the way as quickly as the next man. Um, so we get to the end. Only one, only one casualty, and that's Tomlinson. Mm -hmm. And the final scene in the episode has Tomlinson's widow, though she's not really a widow. They were never officially married. She's waiting in the chapel because apparently she's a masochist. Mm. Kirk and enters. Like, Shat yeah, he he enters and it's like he's he's like full. He's almost like Shatner. Shatner arrives like sh you just see him in like a silhouette. Of he's like in a silhouette. He's a tough. He's a tough yeah. guy. That's he's right. a tough cookie, but he's there for her. He yeah. says, "You see the shoulder, honey? Anytime. It's yeah, that's great. right. That's right. I'll show you my quarters." And uh, but you know, she we'll get... she is is strong. Yeah. He says he says to her he says it never makes any sense, but you have to know there was a reason. And she she just hugs him and looks at him and says she'll be okay. Yeah. And and then she appears later in the episode uh Shore Leave romancing another guy. <laughs> and I think oh, I don't... And how many episodes after that is is that? I, I um it was oh this is so unfortunate. 
It was aired right after this episode. <laughs> oh, wow. See, like, the thing is, people deal with grief. I can almost see that. I'm like, that's an extreme situation. You can see somebody just going complete, you know, slutty. In production order. In production order, this was shot maybe six or seven episodes after Balance of Terror. But for some reason, NBC decided to air it right after this one. No, they don't care. Which people... makes it look like this chick is just on the make. Coin a phrase. Fascinating. Well, she, she is. It, everybody deals with grief differently. I mean, people people slut it up all the time to deal with all kinds of stresses, you know. So it, it almost makes sense, but I'm sure that wasn't intentional. Well, I'm but, hoping that Tomlin's. Oh, I'm hoping that Tomlinson's ghost is haunting her. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Now I think it's in this episode where, through this whole thing where they're just about to die, uh, the, uh, or maybe I'm thinking of the other episode where uh, Rand is always up up in. Kirk's grill and, mm -hmm. and trying to touch touch on him and well yeah I, Rand I, yeah Yeoman Rand it, Jan, Janice is, it, is in this episode yeah it's in this one yeah okay so yeah she's like they seem to always almost be dying in this episode she's, she's always just sort of getting near him oh yeah isn't there, okay yeah isn't there a shot there where the Romulans fire their their plasma uh, weapon and he he uh, she uh, she freaks out and he hugs her and he's hugging her as this plasma thing is coming toward them yeah yeah, it's like it, 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 it's it's a little unusual. The, it, where no man has gone before, the pilot episode with the yeah. you remember Gary Gary Mitchell? Yeah, yeah. He holds a yeoman's hand or something when they're going through the barrier. It's weird. I mean, it's like yeah, we can put these women in this situation, but they're but even though they're in this incredibly dangerous job in Starfleet. Uh, we got to hug them and hold their hands. Well, you know, if you've ever dealt with women, you know, you <laughs> gotta, gotta, sometimes, you know, you just got to do that, you know? Actually, most of the time, I'm frightened out of my wits, and my wife has to hug me. <laughs> <laughs> it's usually how that works. <laughs> or my daughter. I'm like, Regan, come over here and hug Daddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I'll make sure if we're ever like on a on a dying spacecraft, I guess I'll have to take over then at a at a necessity, I guess. <laughs> so, you are now listening to Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast with David Lawler and David B. Anderson, boldly podcasting where no podcast has. I'm not reading this. I'm not. Where's my coat? I'm getting out of here. I hate it here. Any more uh, observations about Balance of Terror? Uh, yes, good. Uh, actually, a really good one because uh, we we watched those those first two, and while they were good, they weren't the best example of the show. And this, I'd say, this is like in that probably in that upper, I'd say, ten percent of the shows. It's a it's a really good. Like I said, it, it reminded me of Wrath of Khan, and it, right. it, it I just I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and I I I, I liked it, and uh, I think it's like if you want to show somebody like a good example. It's it's still got some of the cheese, because you can't not have the cheese. Just with Shatner there. Of course. Well, yeah. Well, but yeah. He, that, he but it's it, entertaining you know, cheese. It's 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 worth. This cheese is worth it. You know, yeah. we see a lot of cheesy stuff in 2017, but it's really kind of cringy, kind of stuff. But this, you you you're more forgiving of of something like this because it was made. You know, how many years ago now? Fifty. It's like fifty years. Fifty years, yeah. And, and there was another thing I kind of like. It's Flash. really not bad for 50 years ago. When I watched this, I was like, you know, this is, this episode, this is 66, 67, probably by now. Yeah, well, it, uh, yeah, I think it was shot and aired in 1966. Okay. This is probably just a little over 10 years removed from Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. This, this couldn't, as far as science fiction goes, this couldn't be any further from Star Wars. This is like what people thought Star Wars could end up being with something like this. Now, Star Trek is great, and it's... Star, but it's... Star Wars is very similar, though, in the way it handles uh, uh, battle in space. Yes. It's always about firing lasers and blowing shit up, even though that really doesn't happen I mean, despite, in science. Despite George Lucas's many filmmaking issues that he has and continued to, had and continued to, continues to have, mm -hmm. that is a much... It just looks better... It, it just, it's better. Yeah, it doesn't even matter if it's not accurate. Yeah. It just looks good. It looks great. Yeah, it looks, has One it, of has my a... favorite bits in Star Wars is right after they escape the Death Star and Luke and Han get into those turrets on the in the Millennium yeah. Falcon and they have that battle with the TIE Fighters. It's freaking awesome. That's like and one of my favorite things. It's like there's a, there's a even though it's complete fantasy and everything, there's a reality to it. Whereas 
you're you're kind of removed from reality when watching something like this. It's it's a combination of it's a fant- Star Trek is a fantastical show and just time, like the 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 silliness of it doesn't necessarily age well, and and just the the cheese factor, like you said, there's a cheese factor, but yet the storytelling and the science fiction you can tell what they're trying to do. Like say compare this to something like a Next Generation. That's mm-hmm. a be- that's a better, much better, fully realized version of the sh- of the concept of the show. Yeah, yeah. But some could argue that this is still more entertaining because it's it's a different kind of show, and and also you know better handled. E- even um, looking at the Blu-rays of Next Generation, they remastered the visual effects for those too. But yeah. those that remastering looks a lot better. Well, yeah, than... it's because the reason it, the reason that is is because. It's more photorealistic, right? Yeah, they, the the way the reason it looked because it always looked kind of strange when they showed it on TV because what they did was everything was shot on film, including all the special effects, mm-hmm. but it would be edited together in a with, video. In video, yeah. In video. video, so it looked. That's I'm why it took say, forever for the show uh, to come out on Blu-ray because they had to go back to the original. They went negatives. back to the original film elements and then redid them, and I think they edited them digitally, and then they could they could do it, yeah. and then it wasn't this weird sort of somewhat video look to the special effects even though it wasn't shot yeah on on video it was actually shot on film but it's just the way they edited it because it was quicker once they once they figured out that they could have higher resolution video they they did they had non-linear avids cutting those episodes and then putting them on to broadcast standard tapes and sending them off to the syndicators they could just get it done quick yeah yeah they could do it really quickly whereas with star uh, star trek it, it would take months well, or I mean, it was like you could either have Star Trek where some of the effects were funky, but they 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 were there, or you could do something like a Battlestar Galactica, where they just reuse the same, uh, like really good effects, but they just reuse them over and over again, and yeah. you kind of like have those options of like I'd rather have somewhat funky special effects well, that for, are consistent. For Balance of Terror, and I think for Enterprise Incident. Uh, the remastered visual effects look look pretty good. And I do see what you're talking about, how they try to kind of dirty it up a little bit, but I like what they did with the... Because the Romulan ship and the visual effects in the original episode, mm-hmm. not that great, not that great. Yeah, in fact, it seems like they're kind of going for the spirit of the special effects because there are parts where, like, they're just sort of shooting at nothing. It's kind of when they're shooting at the ship, trying to uh, shooting at the, at the Romulan ship, trying to blow it up, and then just you just see you don't see yeah. you don't see the ship, you don't see anything. So it's like they're trying to do because that's probably why they did it on the show of like, well, we, we can't afford to put all these different elements in, so we'll just like have a hint of this and a hint of that. So they just yeah. did like a cleaner version of the hint of whatever. Plus, they they make a really they kind of make a big mistake in the script. Mm. Uh, they keep saying fire phasers, but if you look at the effect, it actually looks more like photon torpedoes. Mm. Because phasers are supposed to right. be... Right, phasers, sh- they, yeah, they kind of like go... That. Sh- yeah, you're right. Whereas the photon torpedoes like... They go... They go <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I well, don't know why they didn't correct that. That's interesting. I think at the time, everybody was... you got to understand the time that this was broadcast, this was... This was the this was blowing people's minds. Yeah, it was. It did, and then of course they'd see two thousand one, and that was. I mean, that kind of goes back to the Star Wars of like two thousand. The special effects of two thousand one, they're like on that level of like the Star Wars special effects, where it's like people went from Star Trek to two thousand one, like literally within like two years, mm-hmm. and they were seeing something like that. I mean, of course, it blew everybody's mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what are your kind of thoughts on this? My 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 thought. Oh, this is just. This is like Star Trek at, at its best. They had unprecedented freedom to do whatever they wanted to do within the first maybe nine or ten episodes. This was when uh, Gene Roddenberry was producing the show, and he would shortly after uh, bump himself upstairs to executive producer, and he would have Gene Kuhn come in to produce. Uh, Roddenberry was having constant fights with NBC, uh, and they didn't like him. And when Gene Kuhn came in, they had a better relationship because at least Roddenberry wasn't bugging them so much. So this was like uh, the the prime of the show. It was kind of downhill from all, from here because they they when the network cut their budget, uh, that just made it worse for them. And they had to, but they did have to be more creative. And luckily, they had some great producers who came in and were very good with you know pinching pennies and figuring out how to save 
money. This is the, and this this is still the Captain Kirk that Roddenberry wanted. This was a Captain Kirk who acted more like a captain and less like a guy banging, you know, alien chicks or whatever else. <laughs> Which would he would later be kind of become. Yeah, he kind of they, all the characters sort of steeped into some kind of a stereotype. McCoy got crankier. Spock got more analytical. Uh, but see, that that was the thing. People love people love their Spock. Like yeah. he was always the most popular part of the show because they they watched for Spock of like this weird, <laughs> this weird logical guy that was like. And this is the conflicted. kind of stuff my my wife liked, because she was always uh, my my wife not like she's like a casual Star Trek fan. She only watched it because I watched it, right? But the Kirk she remembered was always the one who was seducing women and being charming and all that stuff. Uh, but she watched episodes like these and was like, this this is a Captain Kirk I really like. He's doing his job. He's no nonsense. Yeah. And that's what he should... He's very... If you look at Captain Kirk in these early episodes, he's very much like Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard is, a, is, is what Gene Roddenberry wanted in a Starship Captain. You know... He would think things through. He would he would have a mission. He would be trying to do a specific thing. Although that kind of gets and, and also, I mean, we're, there's an early scene where they're having a briefing. It's very much like in Next Generation, where Picard always gathers the senior officers together and they talk about the problem. And then he figures out what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it kind of goes to like the in the ne in the next episode. Um, the next episode you, is yeah, that's this is a you, different Star Trek. Yeah, you don't know what Kirk's deal is, at least at the beginning. Yeah, it's a li yeah, yeah, yeah. I and have I have some problems. It's a good episode, but I have a lot of problems with with. I have problems place. with his hair. <laughs> <laughs> you always have problems with his hair, man. Yeah, uh, I do. So there would only be two episodes featuring Romulans in the three-year run of Star Trek. We move forward to the third season, Wait episode minute, there aren't, 59. There aren't, any more? there aren't any more? We only see, we only hear about Romulans. Wow. You know, I mean, we, we see some stock footage of their ships. But we oh. never we never see them again until. Do you think maybe the Klingons kind of took over for that? And yeah, yeah, because the Romulans are expensive. You know, I mean, they're, they they're you know they got the ears and everything and the makeup. The Klingons, well, all you did was put brown paint on them I and just, a fake. I beard. just realized I've been talking about like expensive. I just realized like it kind of goes to the, at the end of the episode when some ships show up, right. and they look like Klingon ships. And yeah. then they just kind of quietly. I think Spock says, "Yes, they have embraced Klingon technology or something." Like well, their yeah. their ships use Klingon technology. I'm wondering if that was an attempt to just, well, we have these ships. We 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 don't like. We only have we only have one Romulan ship, but we have yeah. these Klingon ships. Because you see, you yeah, see yeah. one Romulan ship, and then you see a couple of Klingon ships. And I just realized, and that's <laughs> not actually the one you you watched is not how the original episode went. The original episode was it was a bunch of Klingon ships. No Romulan ships whatsoever. No Romulan ships. Yeah. So, so what happened was not even had the Romulan ship, and they're like, "Well, but we have these Klingon ships. We'll just we'll just say it in a line. We'll say they they use the same technology, and then that way." Yeah, we yeah. Have to intelligence. He says intelligence reports Romulans now using Klingon design. I'm like, what? Yeah. That's kind of a cheap way to get out of it. But mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, this episode is written by Dorothy Fontana, and if you believe her side of the story, the script her script was destroyed by Fred Freeberger and Arthur Singer, the producer and story consultant for season three. Uh, the Romulans would receive offhanded mentions, but never been given decent treatment except for these two episodes. And the Klingons, of course, pop up more because their makeup is cheaper to apply. The, uh, now I'm going to send you the uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to send you the press release for this one. And if you could read it in the form of Dr. William H. Cosby, Ph.D. Captain Kirk William Shatner disguises himself as Vulcan Romulan in an attempt to free the USS Enterprise, which is being held captive by Mr. Spock, Leonard Nimoy, in, in prisoner to the charms of a female Romulan commander on NBC television network's Star Trek. In color, Angelo. <laughs> Romulan ships to surround the Enterprise. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed miss up. Uh, Friday, September 27th, in the Enterprise incident, an invisible shield enables Romulan ships to surround Enterprise without detection. Guest star Joanne Linville has the role of beautiful Romulan commander who entices Spock to take command of the Enterprise. You know, she should have just slipped something in his drink. I think that might have been better. <laughs> Dr. McCoy, DeForest Kelly, pronounces Captain Kirk dead after Spock applies the Vulcan death grip. 
<laughs> try that too. <laughs> and it's really cool too because they have they drink they drink uh, tang out of these square glasses, which is pretty <laughs> awesome. So you have this 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 whole this episode is madness. I mean, it's just complete and utter it, madness because it took we, me a while to figure out what was going on. And and you could see like it, this is where some of uh, Captain Kirk's hostility for Chekhov comes out because he just starts in on Chekhov for no reason at all. He even pushes him aside. Yeah. So it has suspense, uh, uh, suspense, and a bunch mm-hmm. of craziness. That even if it's deliberate, it still makes no sense. Consider considering that the Enterprise is on like the secret mission. So uh, DC Fontana's script defies logic. Uh, so you have Kirk going nuts. Or paranoid, just to get it on McCoy's record. This, this makes no sense because it isn't necessary for Kirk to establish a, a mental breakdown to his crew. All McCoy has to do is draft up some notes in his log, and then we can get on with the mission, right? Yeah, well, it starts off with McCoy. It's like the McCoy log. It's yeah. not usually the captain's log. It's like the, the McCoy, McCoy, and I, I, the, Captain Kirk is acting erratic. He's having yeah. a stress meltdown or something like that. Yeah, and and I I think I think actually uh, this might be one of those examples of Shatner overacting. What do you think? But it was for the purposes of this episode, it's okay I think, because he's doing it on purpose. He, in fact, near the end of the episode, when he's kind of like supposed to be dead and he and he's like on his actual mission, mm-hmm. he's just regular kind of medium Shatner. Yeah, he's he's back to he's back to regular Shatner. I, I, I guess the the idea here is that we have to. Uh, pretend that Kirk is nuts so that he can take the Enterprise past the neutral zone. Mm-hmm. So, or, that the, so that the Federation has, like, like they can have deniability. They can say if it goes wrong, it was a crazy captain. Yeah. So if anything went wrong, you would be the one to blame, McCoy yeah. utters, which covers the writer's ass, basically. <laughs> yeah. So the, the mission as scripted is to steal the Romulan cloaking device. And according to the treaty drafted between the Romulans and the Federation... This would be a staggeringly illegal action, right? Justification yeah. for war. And it's reckless and irresponsible for the Federation to disavow any knowledge of Kirk and Spock's actions, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, once we get past that, we're okay with the with the logic, at least. But the uh, loyal Star Trek audience will be clued into the subterfuge within the first couple of minutes. Uh, Shatner's performance goes beyond over the top and descends into this ridiculous madness. Um, what, what happens here? Okay, he goes nuts. Uh, what happens? He, oh, they, he, for some, okay, we, we were introduced to the Romulan commander, hot chick yeah. Joanne Linville, and suddenly she's all attracted to Spock for some reason. Cause he's, cause he's Vulcan, but he's, he, maybe she reminds him of like a hot Romulan or something. <laughs> a hot Romulan, especially, uh, because I think around that time Leonard Nimoy was getting a lot of fan mail from women. I, I don't know why he turned Spock became a sex symbol for some reason. Because he was so different. He Is was he... so different from and, and, and it's also it's like he's he's almost a comment on repressed men when you think about it. Um yeah, I guess. I, like when you think about it, it's like But he's, I think he's comfortable with his repression though, right? Yeah, he he, he is who he is. He is internal, like he's he's somewhat damaged, but he's like only only women can can heal him with their love or something. You well, know? yeah, you know maybe it maybe it's this delusion that human female Star Trek fans have that they think all Spock needs is one good woman, one good so, Earth woman <laughs> to, to to make him break out of his shell. Yeah, he's had girlfriends before, but his girlfriends have never been able to get through to him. It no, was a, only when he has to mate every seven years so he doesn't die. Yeah, I know. He, he turns into a, a like a, a sex maniac or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> every seven years, pon far. Just catch him, catch him on his on his pon far. You'll be set. It is called pon far. Uh, so there's okay. The Romulan commander starts talking to Spock and almost completely ignoring Kirk, and Kirk is just like, uh, well, Spock starts his performance. His performance is basically, uh, Kirk's nuts. He is not. He he is not sane, and and Shatner. We cut right before the commercial break. We cut the Shatner's wild eyes, and we hear this music <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. The strain of command has worn heavily upon him. He has not been himself for several weeks. That's a lie. As you can see, Captain Kirk is a highly sensitive and emotional person. I believe he has lost the capacity for rational decision. Shut up, Spock. 
I'm betraying no secrets. The commander's suspicion that Starfleet ordered the Enterprise into the neutral zone is unacceptable. Our rapid capture demonstrates its foolhardiness. You filthy liar. I am speaking the truth for the benefit of the Enterprise and the Federation. I say now, and for the record, that Captain Kirk ordered the Enterprise across the neutral zone on his own initiative and his craving for glory. I'll kill you! I'll kill you! He is not sane. And he says, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, you filthy traitor. And then they throw him into the brig. And then Kirk smashes himself up against the force field or something. And then they bring McCoy over uh, to examine him. And he says, you know, Kirk's nuts. He's got feelings of persecution, abandonment issues or whatever else. And then um, Spock comes in and then applies his famous Vulcan death grip. Uh, which, you know, helpfully, Nurse Chapel informs us there's no such thing as a Vulcan death grip. How the hell does she know? <laughs> I, there's an episode that DC Fontana wrote called Journey to Babel, which has Mark Lennard as Spock's dad, and she establishes that Vulcans had a death penalty involving snapping people's necks. So why wouldn't there be such a thing as a Vulcan death grip, you know? Maybe. I mean, if they if he can knock you out just by pinching your neck or whatever, they could probably come up with a, a million Didn't different he, ways. But he applied something to him that makes him look dead. Yeah, yeah, kind of, I guess or something me, like that. Yeah, I, I I don't quite know how that happens. I I don't know how they come to the conclusion because they're because McCoy says you're lucky they didn't start an autopsy because Kirk comes to. Yeah. And I guess his mission is to masquerade as a Romulan, go aboard the ship, and steal the cloaking device. Yes. So we get to the Romulan commander, which is the lovely Joanne Linville. It's written, she's a pussycat. Mm. Or perhaps a jellyfish, the way she crumbles when Spock starts putting these moves on her that are against his character, really. Well, he's just kind of doing the he's just kind of doing the hand Vulcan. It's like the, the sexy Vulcan hand thing what, where he what just is sort that? of is that their like I am not Vulcan? it's kind of like an I am not touching you kind of a thing. Is that is that like Vulcan foreplay or something? It could be, yeah. Because she's like, I, and it doesn't make any sense to me because she's supposed to be a commander. And oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's because he's Vulcan and she's Romulan and it's like some sort of interesting mix where it's like forbidden love or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, th this wouldn't feel out of place like in an episode of The Man from Uncle, except you would have Ilya subbing for Spock in this case. But Spock, I think he behaves in a wildly illogical way. And I, I think that the Romulan commander would, would see right through that. And. Uh, there's another thing I want to mention. All of these elements were pre present in the original early drafts. And and her main complaints that she had to the producers when they rewrote her script had to do with Spock's skill with the commander and the ease with which he romances her. Nobody, you know, she didn't really buy it. Even though I, all of this is kind of, it's it's like a weird theater that's going on. It's like all all of this is fake because it's all meant just to get that cloaking device. Yeah, and I noticed something like when 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 they put her in the in the Vulcan or not in the in the in the Romulan sort of makeup, mm -hmm. which they would later do stuff like that on. Uh, I think they did it to to Riker, didn't they? They make him Romulan at some point. They made well, yeah, they made him okay. There was a um, what was it? Who watches the Watchers? I'm kind of a nut when it comes to this stuff. What happens okay. is. Spock's contaminating this boy, Jim. There's this race of people that are distant relatives of Vulcans. And again, I, I, I don't know if this is like a cyborg thing or something like that, but these people are more Vulcan. They're not like particularly military. They're, they're peaceful people. And they, uh, I think Crusher makes up Riker and Troy to look like these people. And I remember Ray Wise is in it too. He plays it. And for some reason they think Picard is God. And Picard keeps having to tell him, I'm not God, I'm not God, stop calling me God. But they, they just don't look right. I mean, and the thing about it, I don't know, Troy kind of pulls it off a little bit more, but Riker doesn't. He looks kind of goofy as a as a fake Vulcan. Yeah. But I was thinking that Shatner, I mean, what do you think of Shatner's makeup? Uh, do you, I actually, I, 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 it makes him look vaguely Asian. Uh, you know, he's got kind of eyes thing, and a, and a thing. the thing that stuck in my head was, I see, I'd never actually seen this episode, uh -huh. but I knew I knew that image of him as the as the Romulan because they used it in the trailer for Star Trek Six. 
There's like this trailer for maybe I'll have to send it to you, but there's a trailer for Star Trek Six where they show like various clips from movies and and TV episodes, and it's like kind of like projected onto the Enterprise. It's actually a shot. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I saw that trailer uh, when we went to see. I took my girlfriend at the time. I took her to see Naked Gun Two and a Half. Yeah, this would have been like late ninety. This would have been like mid ninety one or something. Yeah, I took. It there was a trailer. Footage. There was a trailer for Star Trek Six. And it had this kind of weird, yeah, exactly yeah, they, what they, you said. They, yeah, they project. It was like they just used footage. For, they basically used clips from TV episodes and movies and put it on the Enterprise shot from I think the end of Star Trek: The Motion Picture when they have that long shot of the Enterprise mm-hmm. and then it goes into warp. Yeah, and that that was so. It's like that piece of like picture. I was already in my head of like so when I saw, it, I was like, I remember that. Mm-hmm. That's that's all I knew it from. <laughs> And then, and then, of course, I, I later, I saw that trailer, and then, like, you know, later in Next Generation, they did that, I think, with Riker, where they made him up. So I was kind of like, oh, that must have been what they did. They yeah, just, they, like, they do, like, a thing. It's kind of like a surgery sort of thing. Oh, plus, you know, there was the episode that Leonard Nimoy was in, where they made Data and Picard look up, they made them up to look like Romulans. Oh! I'll have to go back to that one. I don't remember that. Yeah, and, and I don't know, uh... They... I do. I, I will say I do like how the continuity, in a weird way, like in in these 2009 Star Trek, mm-hmm. they kept that continuity where he was ambassador to Romulus. No, you 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 broke our cardinal rule, David. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned that movie. Yeah, it, well, it does fit. It does. We'll see. But this is all. See, stuff there there that was happened. this guy. His name is J.J. Abrams, and he yes. said, uh, "I'm Superboy fan." of Star Wars and Star Trek, and I'm going to live a life that only you will envy, which yeah. is to <laughs> direct and make Star Wars and Star Trek movies. Um, well, I, I, uh, we kind of figure out what the plan is when Spock is rescued. He spends all this time romancing the, the Romulan commander, and we know Scotty's going to work his magic and install the cloaking device and use it against the Romulans. And speaking and I, of Scotty, this is... A- like he has different hair in the third season. He has kind of like a like a blow dried slick back. He, hair yeah, yeah, he thing. has a slick back. Um, he has a slick back look for a couple of for the first like seven or eight episodes of the third season, and then and then he goes uh, back to the comb over thing. Yeah, well, no, it's like he they gray it and they give him sideburns or something like that. I don't know why they messed with his hair so much. It's weird. They changed it. They changed it back in the movies. He had back to the same sort of old hairstyle. Yeah. Uh, but this, despite these these problems, this is still like a great and memorable episode. It's never boring. It's completely over the top and it's utterly unrealistic. But uh, could um, we say this is the Star Trek Five of the series? <laughs> I don't know. No, no, that would probably be the way to Eden. I, oh, yeah. That's that's much later in the third season. This this is actually one of the better third season episodes that were made. Uh, still not as good as Balance of Terra because Balance of Terra has 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 such a great dimensional quality to it not only with the the characterizations as they were originally envisioned by Roddenberry but also the ancillary characters have so much going for them whereas in this it's mainly you know because they they cut the budget it became the Kirk Spock McCoy show more than anything else so a lot of the other characters were just sort of pushed to the side they did give Scotty more to do though in the third season uh, but uh, Dorothy Fontana, being an extremely talented writer and responsible for some of the more memorable episodes of Star Trek, Tomorrow Was Yesterday, Charlie X, Friday's Child with Julie Newmar in it, Journey to Babel, the extensive rewrite of By Any Other Name that we talked about, uh, in addition to being the show's best story supervisor and script consultant, she also had the temperament of a typical stubborn writer. She didn't mind rewriting other people's scripts, but she hated being re- rewritten by people that she viewed as inexperienced novices such as the people Roddenberry brought in to handle the third season. So she clashed with Roddenberry and Robert Justman as well. But after this script was delivered and shot, she took her name off of everything else she was working on and abandoned her work uh, and used the pseudonym Michael Richards. Uh, not the same Michael Richards who <laughs> plays Kramer. <laughs> I think, I think uh, that name came from her two brothers, Michael and Richard. So she just combined them for the pseudonym. But uh, otherwise, I really like this episode. What did what, you think of it? I liked it. Uh, again, I was confused. There were a few things. To it. First, it was throwing me off where, because as soon as it starts, Kirk is like acting erratic. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, 
there has to be some. I knew there had to be some reason. Yeah. I'm like, because this is not normal. I mean, of course he's he's Kirk and he does his Kirkisms, but this is not normal Kirk. This is not normal Kirk weirdness. This is this is weird Kirk weirdness. So I'm like, well, what's going on? And then I got distracted by his weird hair. That it was like this. It wasn't his best piece. It wasn't his best hair day. So it was kind of like frizzy and falling off kind of thing. And yeah. uh, it was bugging me. <laughs> and then and then and then it got to the story. And then I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. So it's he's so Kirk uh, and you so, still have uh, to keep you have to keep wondering why the hell is he behaving this way like yeah. he says he like uh, they're having a little meeting in in the conference room and 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 McCoy says he says you ordered us into the neutral zone he says dismissed doctor he says but Jim he says I said dismissed <laughs> <laughs> I said good day sir <laughs> he's like what um, the hell is going on but so, McCoy but already said, knew about all this though I don't know maybe he was trying to kind of just keep it keep keep it alive or something because like they're they're being observed by the 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 romulans i think maybe or they were, they were just all in it, in I mean, on it I, except I, for I did Scotty. like i did like kind of at the end that kind of goes to the version i saw with the slightly better special effects mm -hmm. having the slightly better special effects helped it tell the story better especially oh, they, at, yeah they did a much better job they, these visual effects make a lot more sense than the than the original episode because the way that they showed it is is like so they use the cloaking device, and then they're but they're like, well, just fire at the last known coordinates, mm -hmm. and then and then they're able to move away, and and like they they show them like shooting at nothing. That's right. Yeah. And, and like the way that they showed it in in the version I saw, the cleaned up version, it was easy to understand what was going on. I can only imagine with the limited special effects of what they had, of like yeah. what did he look like? Could you even understand what they were doing? Yeah, they only had like for the entire show for the three seasons. They only had like a handful of, of shots and they couldn't really do anything more. Uh, the only other time that did they did special effects specifically for an episode was, I think, the Tholian web. Mm -hmm. And those were really fantastic. And actually, that was the only time Star Trek ever won an Emmy was for that show. But we'll get to that when we get to that. I mean, it's like it's such a contrast to the, the quality of the special effects that they would have later in the films, especially in that first film. Mm hmm. Which almost wasn't, I mean, you know, because they, they did a bunch of special effects on, on the first movie and then had to scrap them because they were so bad and then they yeah. had to go back. And then they got actually quality people. And then they, they did, like, arguably still probably the best special effects of any of the films is the first film, I think. Yeah, that and also I think the Nebula sequence in Star Trek Two was fantastic yeah. as well. But, I mean, there's stuff in Star Trek Two like where... The just, uh, well, the explosion of the, of the Genesis planet. Genesis planet, yeah. I mean... But they even reused some of the special effects from the first Star Trek movie, like the first, like when they show up at the Enterprise. Yeah, it's yeah. like all just reused stuff, and they just put different music on it, and somehow you buy it. <laughs> like yeah, that's it took true. a few viewings yeah, before yeah. I even noticed it. Like, I'm well, like, yeah, they had to. Reused? Yeah, when they did Star Trek Two, they had to. It was a much lower budget. Yeah, it was much a much lower, lower budget. budget, so you saw a lot of duplicates of shots from that first movie. But yeah, a but lot then of once those Enterprise Enterprise flybys are fantastic. Yeah. So they figured, hey, we spent forty million dollars on these effects. Yeah. We're gonna use well, them. they spent yeah, they spent like half of that was just development. Like, oh, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do a new series. No, we're gonna do a movie. No, we're gonna do a series. No, we're gonna do a mini series. No, we're gonna do a movie. And then right. they find like we're gonna do a movie. So it's like all this money goes into that, and then they do those special effects that they have to scrap, and then that costs money. And then there's you know there's like Shatner's hair. You know that's expensive. <laughs> so I am tired. Let's get the hell out of here. All right. Well, let's wrap this one up. This has been uh, Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast with David Waller and David B. Anderson. Uh, join us next time where we'll be discussing. Uh, I'm not really sure. What are we discussing? <laughs> I don't know. It's your show. Um, where's. Okay. Let me see. If I, oh, okay. The okay, next well, episode will be uh, Kirk's Private Little Wars, uh, The Conscience of the King and, Obs and Obsession. Hmm. from season one and two i look forward to that all right so we'll see you then bye bye okay bye bye you have, you have been listening to ship to ship a star trek podcast with your hosts david lawler and david b anderson to find out more about us subscribe to our youtube channel or visit us at www.blissville.net or on facebook at misadventures in blissville good night